the red centre of Australia. It's right in the centre. This is the driest region of the driest inhabited continent on Earth. People say that it is the heart of Australia. Those people are wrong. It is the belly button. First of all, it's pretty close to the middle. Second, uh, not many people get the chance to see it. If you're the size of a continent, you're not going to be showing much midriff. We should change that, but that's how it is. And finally, if you look closely enough, you can find an unsettling amount of life inside it. I leave that with you. So, let's dive right in. Yummy. My name is Caleb McElroy. I became a zoologist after growing up loving Australian wildlife. All of this came together most recently when I completed a thesis on how wallabies and echidnas each grow their penises. This is the thousand yard stare of a man who will never taste sweet innocence again. And that's an echidna penis. But that's for another film. This film is about the red centre of Australia. Very low rainfall makes surviving here a dangerous business, but the peaks and valleys of the West Macdonald Ranges provide welcome shelter while the animals wait for rain. The black-flanked rock wallaby is one of 16 species in the rock wallaby family, which at that size we can only assume is Catholic. Speaking of minimal waste, this male smells opportunity. A female. She might even be receptive. Or at least, she won't kick him in the face. The dense living in these oases is the quickest way I've found to institutionalise violence. Defensive jazz hands universally declare the fight to be over. Unfortunately, the female smells pregnant, which is gross. His efforts frustrated, the male goes back to venting his testosterone through his fists. Even after all his efforts, the only thing this male has successfully done is heinously accost literally his entire neighbourhood and in broad daylight. But rock wallabies, and indeed mammals, are not the only animals here to face internal competition. Western bowerbird males construct meticulously kept courtship areas known as bowers, like an online dating profile made out of sticks and spit. Decorating with white and other very specifically selected objects, males will do anything they can to disrupt the aesthetic and ethnic purity of a competitor's bower decorations. They treat these collections as art galleries dedicated to... seduction. It's very explicit. And if you ever see one in the wild, you should cover the eyes of any nearby children. Yours or not. Let us not impurify the children. Anyway, uh, this one with the aneurysm, presumably, heads off to give himself a self-congratulatory preen, and the other male is allowed to put his ornamental bush tomato back in place. Oh, and, and the stick. In the desolate, sandy plains between the mountains, a mother grey-headed honeyeater cares for her chicks. Like the young of any species, they won't shut up. Either they'll be handed over to the local orphanage, or their parents will preoccupy their larynxes with food shortly. We'll come back to them later. All this competition for romance, successful or otherwise, of course needs a romantic setting. Soft pastel dawns, and an Eiffel Tower-like edifice breaking the horizon. And the Red Centre has something that does just that, and signifies so much more. Uluru. Uluru is a monolith. A single solitary mass of rock. It is held together by enormous multi-directional pressure underground. Uluru is the mother of all rocks, in the same way that Dwayne the Rock Johnson is the mother of all people. Uluru is 348 metres higher than the surrounding plains and extends another 6 kilometres underground, as well as being 10 kilometres in circumference. But visually, Uluru really speaks for itself. So... Take it away, Uluru. I'm just gonna go and eat this sandwich. 
Oh, hey, come, come eat sandwich with me. Oh, oh, sandwich? All right. Oh. Mm, linseed. Mm. That's so good. It's a hair. Oh, it's oh. moldy. It's long. Back hair? Back, mm. back hair. Oh, no. That's good, bro. Definitely a front hair. Mmm, yummy sandwich. Oh, it's pickle. Katachuta, also pronounced kate to jate, incorrectly, obviously, is a series of rocky domes neighbouring Uluru. The Valley of the Winds is a gap between the domes through which most of Katachuta's wind passes. Mm. That's so good. Funneling the wind is like a defence strategy. Wind is one of the most erosive forces on the planet after rain, ice and marital trust issues. It's a strategy laid out in the book The Art of War. You focus the attacks of your enemy in one spot so you can relax everywhere else. So in a sense, the Valley of the Winds is basically just Carter Tudor doing something we can all relate to, which is making sure the wind only passes through the cracks that it's aware of. That was a dumb joke. Anyway, the story of Central Australia is one of age, wind, and rain. The West Macdonald Ranges might be the oldest on Earth, Wind and rain over all this time have reduced the mountains to mere skeletons of their former might. This presents a dilemma. All of the Red Centre's wildlife is absolutely dependent on the eventual arrival of these rains, but the rain is also erasing the landscape that these animals exist in. Now, there's a little saying in natural history filmmaking. Always, always, always intervene. So, when I realised this, I knew I was going to have to do something that would stop this erosion on a geological timescale. Finally, it hit me. It wouldn't be easy, but I was going to have to kill the rain. So I ran around, furiously swatting the raindrops from the air with my hands and any other appendage available. Like all individuals in wars, I had the distinct impression that I personally was making a really meaningful difference. And yet, something more had to be done. So, in a flailing mass of insatiable swatting, I ran at the largest storm I could find. And there, as I tried to kill Zeus, the pleurophilic perpetrator of Uluru's erosion, with a lightning strike, he smote me, and I died. Only joking. I know it looks gruesome, but you should see Zeus. Stop it. Stop it. This is so Stop it. <clears throat> mm. At the advent of rain, a wave of new life washes across the landscape. This renewal brings with it an eruption of short-lived, brightly coloured wildflowers. Flowers are a plant's reproductive organs, notably including their testicles. As the soil rapidly dries, the flower drops right off in the heat which hopefully should serve as a deterrent to you emulating such behaviour. And it looks like it's just another chance to say not today to parental abandonment. Mother grey-headed honey eater has returned and her vomit is marginally better than orphan food. So everybody wins. Except, obviously, for those orphans. Which reminds me, I must remember to feed mine. Common wallaroos are well adapted for the dry, regularly going 14 days, 90 if they need to, without drinking. And surveying this region's boom and bust is its apex predator, the magnificent wedge-tailed eagle. For every apex predator in an ecosystem, there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of prey animals as food species. With so many supporting one at the top, it's like trickle-up economics, only it's nutrition rather than money, uh, it completely contradicts gravity, and it actually stands a chance of making sense. So, as the wedge-tailed eagle sits atop and feeds from its proverbial pyramid of prey species, we begin to get a sense of the interconnectedness of all the animals' lives in this harsh desert landscape. The wildlife here erupts in population after rain, before receding into the many dry months to come. The enduring spirit of the wildlife here has made the Red Centre a landscape that defines much of our national identity. 
and therefore it's something that unites us. So the next time someone on the street asks you to show them your belly button, don't cry. Tell them it's their belly button too, and then show them this film. Because this is a belly button we can all share. And if it takes a gigantic, dry, sandy belly button to bring us together, then so be it.